Okay, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to another SAGE uh, highlight for this afternoon. Uh, just before I get into introducing uh, Jeffrey Alderman to you, um, can I just confirm that you should have all received the August uh, programme. Uh, another four weeks of interesting talks, uh, quite a variety. Um, so that should be with you. It was sent out yesterday. Um, just to remind you again that we are doing a, our own Desert Highland Discs uh, session in, in October. We have had quite a number of you have already <laughs> written into our Sage email address. Um, I'll remind you of that at the end of the programme. Uh, but it's been very interesting the variety of music that people have uh, noted down where they have memories attached to a certain piece of music and given us some descriptions of why that's important. We would still like more of you because uh, even if we get too many, we can always do a second session. I'll give you the email address again now, actually. It's bushysage at gmail.com. Just tell us the piece of music that uh, you want to feature and a short description why that piece of music is important to you. So, uh, as I say, we will come back to those of you who have already written to us, uh, and we'll then start to plan for this session in October. Right, on to this afternoon's session. Delighted to welcome Geoffrey Alderman, Professor Geoffrey Alderman to you. Uh, most of you have probably heard from him over the last 10 minutes or so. I actually looked up his uh, resume on Wikipedia, but Jeffrey clearly has given us a, a much wider introduction, not least of all to being a trainee steam train driver, which didn't feature on Wikipedia. So I shall just read out the bit that I wrote down that was his official introduction. Jeffrey is a British historian, especially of the Jewish community in England in the 19th and 20th centuries, and an academic, political advisor, and journalist. And Jeffrey is going to talk to us this afternoon. Um, he asked the question, what should be the role of the historian writing about the history of British Jewry? To what extent should the historian censor what he writes in order to meet other perceived communal priorities? An interesting question, Geoffrey, that I hope you're going to answer for us. So over to you for the next hour-ish. We're in your hands now, Geoffrey. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to address you uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak uh, for about uh, 50 minutes uh, and of course then there will be an opportunity for questions. The um, stimulus for this, uh, for this lecture uh, was provided by a, a radical decision that I took in my academic life in December uh, 1999, just 20 years ago, just over 20 years ago, to um, uh, uh, take up a position that I had been offered in, uh, in the United States of America. There is a long and honourable history of Anglo-Jewish academics seeking refuge, as I did, in the United States. The first was that of Rabbi Dr. Solomon Schechter, one of the world's leading rabbinic scholars. Solomon Schechter was not much loved by the late Victorian Anglo Jewry into which he came as a young man from Germany in 1882. As reader in rabbinic and Talmudic literature at Cambridge University, he was in truth the only world-class rabbinic scholar resident in England at the end of the 19th century. But Schechter grew progressively disenchanted with the lack of importance attached by British Jewry to the rabbinate in general and to his own work in particular. This disillusion expressed itself most eloquently and most cogently in his four epistles to the Jews of England, which were originally published in the Jewish Chronicle in 1901 and which were reprinted in book form. The following year, Schechter left for the USA. His four epistles are still worth reading. They have a decidedly modern ring about them. And I've thought a great deal about them in surveying and trying to make sense of my own experience as a scholar of and writer about Anglo-Jewish history and Anglo-Jewish society. 
As I point out in the introduction to my book, uh, uh, British Jewry Since Emancipation, uh, which was published by uh, University of uh, Buckingham Press uh, five or six years ago, I myself was not trained as an historian of Anglo Jewry. And although I met and enjoyed the company and hospitality of the late Dr. Cecil Roth uh, and his fascinating wife, Irene, when I was a student at Oxford in the 1960s, I was not at that time tempted to follow him in researching and writing about the Jewish communities of Britain. It was while preparing a book on the British electoral system that I pondered why no one had ever confronted the development of Anglo-Jewish voting habits. I determined to repair this admission and in due course wrote a book, The Jewish Community in British Politics, which Oxford University Press published in 1983. Shortly after the appearance of this book, the then honorary officers of the Federation of Synagogues, of which I'm a lifelong member, commissioned me to write the Federation Centenary History, published in 1987 and updated a couple of years ago, while an approach from the European Science Foundation led to a study of London Jewry and London politics, 1889 to 1986, which uh, Messrs. Routledge published in 1989. Incidentally, that book is the only book I've written which has a disacknowledgement section as well as an acknowledgement section. In the disacknowledgement section, I, I disacknowledge the hindrance of two people who went out of their way not to help me write the book. One of those two people was the late Victor Mishkon, and um, you can have a guess as to who the other one was. It's fair to say that each of these works has attracted controversy. My view is that I'm merely one participant in a movement, a reaction to the public relations history the British jury had been accustomed to read hitherto, and of which it must be said Cecil Roth had been an accomplished exponent. Roth's History of the Jews in England, which Oxford University Press first published in 1941, virtually ended with political emancipation in 1858. The period 1858 to 1905 was dismissed in four pages. The period after 1905, Roth did not regard as history at all. Albert Hyamsom's History of the Sephardim in England, which appeared 10 years later, devoted precisely 13 pages to the 20th century and left much unsaid into the bargain. Albert Hyamson's excuse was, and I quote him, the historian ought never to deal or attempt to deal with events of which he has a personal knowledge, unquote. And it was, I think, for the same reason that the history of the Jews in Britain since 1858, a book written by the late Dr. Vivian Lippmann, who was a pupil of Roth, and which was published posthumously after Vivian's death, uh, which was published in 1990, contained but 15 pages on the development of Anglo Jewry over the, the then past 50 years. Sensitive issues were quickly passed over or simply ignored. Vivian was as aware as I was of the growing body of scholarly research by a younger generation, generation of British, American and Israeli academics whose findings have revolutionized our understanding of modern Anglo-Jewish history. Vivian Lippmann was a personal friend of mine. We talked often of these themes, but he knew and I knew that the book he was writing would never expose the new reality. The title of my lecture today constitutes a personal reflection on the stresses and perils of attempting to write in a scholarly way about Anglo-Jewish history and Anglo-Jewish affairs. By censorship, I mean, of course, the veto by those in actual or presumed authority exercised in relation to the freedom of expression which we all enjoy under the law. By self-censorship, I mean the exercise of censorship by the author for communal or political reasons, perhaps out of fear, perhaps, as in the cases of Roth, Heimson and Lippmann, out of a misplaced sense of communal obligation. During the 1970s, as I say, 
I became academically interested in the phenomenon of the Jewish vote in British politics. I began to survey Anglo-Jewish voting habits. I carried out polls of Jewish voters and I began to write on the subject. One day, I received a phone call from the Board of Deputies of British Jews. It was from a man now deceased called Dr. Jack Gewurz, who was then head of the, of the, of the security department uh, of the board. And he invited me to a free lunch with him and uh, the then, uh, vice pre a then vice president of the board, late Mr. Martin Savitt. What did they want? As my late father said, Jeffrey, there's no such thing as a free lunch. What did they want? Well, they said they wanted to discuss my work. But what actually happened at that lunch, which was a very nice lunch, incidentally, was a clumsy attempt to dissuade me from continuing with my research and from publishing my findings. Now, I should explain that my findings by then included the names of Jewish members of the National Front. I had apparently transgressed the supreme communal commandment. Thou shalt not wash dirty linen in public. My religious instincts mercifully saved me from obeying this diktat then and since. But as my academic career progress, progressed and I sifted my way through the layers of lies, duplicity and shabby gentility, which have characterised and which I'm afraid to some extent continue to characterise the writing of Anglo-Jewish history, I came to understand more about the origins of this commandment, thou shalt not wash dirty linen in public, and more about its malevolent impact on us all. Diaspora Jewries evolved as internally self-governing communities, I'm talking about Central and Eastern Europe, and indeed in the Arab world. They were internally self-governing communities whose relationship with their Gentile hosts, be they Christian or Muslim, was a most delicate matter, left for the most part to court Jews and other communal machers and the rabbis they appointed. Their policy was to contain all disputes within the community, making use of batai din and a range of social and religious sanctions so that the external image of the community might be sanitised as sanitized as possible. Image was all. And if you look at the original uh, uh, rules and regulations of the Spanish and Portuguese Congregation of London, it's interesting that much of those regulations have to do with the disciplining of members of the Bevis Marx community for what they might do outside the synagogue. This was the protection of communal image. Emancipation, of course, does not exist, coexist easily with this philosophy. As full citizens of the state, Jews have access to all the machinery of justice and redress provided not only by the state itself, but by other means, primarily the media. Aggrieved Jews and Jewesses of a variety of Jewish religious inclinations habitually resort to the British courts of justice, bringing cases against co-religionists and they appear to have no qualms about having their grievances against fellow Jews aired in the media. But the issue of dirty linen and how best to wash it goes beyond problems related to the perception operation of the Batai Din and the men who serve on them. In my inaugural lecture as a professor in the University of London, I became a professor in uh, 1989 and the inaugural lecture was 1990. I warned that we live in an open society in which groups and individuals are free to voice their opinions and in which private citizens, including Jews, have access to a range of grievance re remedying machineries. British Jewry, however, continues to be in a technical sense an irresponsible society, I use that word irresponsible purely technically, because we are saddled with a set of communal structures 
which function without having to account publicly and often without having to account at all for the policies they pursue and for the actions they take. Indeed, I would say that over the decades since I gave that uh, inaugural lecture, it, has in, it was in fact published, uh, it was called anglo Jury: A Suitable Case for Treatment. I think the situation has got worse. As a new power elite, the funding fathers and their tame rabbis have undermined the work of such democratic structures as we still possess. British Jews also need to ask themselves whether they are mature enough to discuss their problems in an open manner. Many Jews are critical of those who air matters of Jewish sexual mores in public. This is because they themselves have not come to terms with. This is perhaps because they themselves have not come to terms with and find it difficult to handle their own sexuality. Pedophile activities are unfortunately a fact of Jewish life in modern Britain and they affect all, affect all types of Jew from the secular to the sectarian orthodox. It is no good pretending that the problem does not exist or that it will go away if we all stop speaking about it. The Almighty knows better, which is of course why on Yom Kippur we read aloud and publicly in the synagogue passages from the Torah relating to prohibited sexual activities. I published Modern British Jewry, my first account of the history of British Jews since emancipation. I published it with Oxford University Press in 19, uh, 1992. Some years later, Oxford invited me to write an additional fact, uh, chapter for a paperback edition of this book, taking the story from circa 1990 to circa 1998. In the original edition, I'd paid scant attention to issues of sexuality within Anglo Jewry, save in the context of the early Anglo Jewish feminist movement, of which the foundations of liberal Judaism were, in a sense, an outcome. During the 1990s, sexuality has be had become much more of a preoccupation for British Jews. What interested me was not merely the fact that such alleged abuse was at last being talked about, but the manner in which the Anglo-Jewish press chose to report such events. In almost every case, not quite, but in almost every case, the Anglo-Jewish press coverage followed that in the non-Jewish press. But in one relation to one celebrated case involving a leading figure in, in what one might call central orthodoxy within Anglo Jewry, an alumnus of Jews College, whose help in the translation of the, uh, uh, in the, whose help in the task of translation had been acknowledged in the completely new edition of the Singer's Prayer Book, no Jewish newspaper or non-Jewish newspaper for that matter, chose to report two public court appearances followed by pleas of guilty to three charges of indecent assault on young boys. And some of you will know now, I'm referring to the uh, shocking case of the late Professor Sidney Greenbaum, formerly Quain Professor of English at University, of, uh, University College London, whose conviction at Hendon Magistrates Court in August 1990 was, I can assure you, well known to the Jewish Chronicle but for reasons best known to its then uh, editor, Geoffrey Paul, the matter was hushed up and, and not reported about at all. Any professional historian working in British Jewish history knows that he or she walks a minefield and that to the assertion of too independent a judgment can bring down communal wrath in full measure. I don't really think that the pressures we historians faced are well understood even by our co-religionists, let alone by the world outside. I will recall how in the spring of 1989, my satisfaction in accepting an invitation from the Jewish Historical Society of England to deliver a paper to it was rudely interrupted when the then programme committee of the society 
expressed its displeasure on learning that I proposed to talk on the career of Morris Harold Davis, president of the Federation of Synagogues 1928 to 1944, one of the most important figures in labor politics and political corruption uh, uh, in Stepney between the two world wars, whose career, as some of you may know, was brought to an abrupt end by a trial at the Old Bailey in December 1944 uh, and a prison sentence. It, it, incidentally, I've held in my hands the chutzpah letter that Davis wrote from prison uh, to the then Secretary of the Federation of Synagogues in 1945, uh, saying that there was nothing in the Constitution of the Federation that said he couldn't be in prison and president of the Federation of Synagogues at the same time. Astonishing letter. And of course, the uh, Federation of Synagogues had, uh, those of you who understand Yiddish, geschwind, quickly had to alter their constitution. So what was the objection of the Programme Committee of the Jewish Historical Society to my lecturing on this thing? The objection, ladies and gentlemen, appears to have been not that I would say things about Davis that were untrue or could not be supported by the evidence, but that what I would say would be only too true. I stood my ground, the programme committee backed off, and the paper was delivered and published. You can read it in the transactions, published transactions of the society. In the inaugural lecture, which I gave following my elevation to a personal chair in the University of London, I drew attention to this incident, but omitted to mention another far graver in my view, which had occurred but a few months previously. I had wished for some considerable period to examine a particular archive of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, namely an unpublished chapter written by the 19th century scholar, explorer and anti-Semite Sir Richard Burton, translator into English of the Arabian Nights and incidentally of the Kama Sutra. In 1872, Burton had written a deeply anti-Semitic work the Jew, the Gypsy, and El Islam. He was prevailed upon by friends not to publish it. But after his death, the work was published by his widow's friend, w. H. a scoundrel called W. H. Wilkins, minus a chapter on, on the subject with which Burton had become obsessed, namely the so-called blood libel, the allegations that Jews murdered Christians and used their blood for a variety of purposes, including the baking of matzahs. The suppressed chapter, entitled Human Sacrifice Amongst the Sephardine or Eastern Jews, was subsequently acquired by the Board of Deputies and for 80 or so years had lain suppressed in its archives. I wished to read it and the associated correspondence, which I felt, rightly as it turned out, would yield valuable information on the defence policy of the Board at the beginning of the 20th century. I well understood the sensitivity of this matter, which I'd raised as a deputy on the floor of the board until silenced by the then president, the late uh, Greville Janner. But when later, after Janner had retired as president and had been succeeded by Dr. Lionel Koplovitz, uh, when that happened, uh, I took up the matter again and Lionel, did offer me access to the archive, but, but ladies and gentlemen, on condition, on two conditions. One was that I would not divulge anything from the archive without the prior permission of the president. This I did not find problematic at all. And then by my, Lionel required me to adhere to other conditions, which had nothing remotely to do with the archive, but which pertained to my role and profile in a quite different matter, the communal defense of Shechita. In other words, my access to the archive was now dependent upon my keeping my mouth shut on a current matter then of great communal interest and importance. I should add incidentally that after a long standoff, I was eventually permitted to see the, the, the Burton archive at the offices of the board 
uh, and and um, those of you who are interested in this subject uh, can read an article in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society, which I published, uh, co-authored with uh, Professor Colin Holmes of the University of Sheffield. P Professor Holmes is arguably the, uh, the greatest living expert on anti-Semitism in modern British society. I can think of another example of pressures being put upon historians of Anglo Jewry to omit matters which it was deemed not to be in the public interest to reveal. For example, the quite intolerable pressure <coughs> put upon Dr. Sharman Kaddish, who had been appointed to write the official history of the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade. Now, I'm in a, in a position to speak authoritatively about this disgraceful epi episode because Dr. Kaddish was, for the purpose of carrying out this research, appointed to a special research fellowship at Royal Holloway College, where I was then a professor. And I was appointed as a member uh, of an official advisory committee which guided but never directed Dr. Kaddish as the work progressed. At a very late stage in the production process, Dr. Kaddish was required by those who had commissioned the book to delete a passage relating to the anti-Zionist activities of the late Sir Louis Gluckstein, a patron of the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade in the interwar years. The reason behind this requirement was that the brigade feared it would lose the patronage of the Gluckstein family were the passage to remain in it. The truth of what Dr. Kaddish had written about Sir Louis was never challenged. She was required to delete the passage, which she published elsewhere, I'm happy to say, as a condition of the book being published. For those of you who are interested in what this uh, passage contained, it was in fact a reference to uh, Louis Gluckstein was a member of parliament, Tory member of parliament, and the passage that the uh, brigade wanted deleted referred to Louis Gluckstein's a very enthusiastic anti-Zionist, I repeat, anti-Zionist activities in the interwar period. But if this remarkable case of shabby gentility uh, 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 takes one's breath away, it's dwarfed by a truly breathtaking act of censorship, which rose to international prominence in 1997. I refer to the publication by the Jewish Chronicle in its edition of the 14th of March 1997 of a heavily censored version of the now infamous letter which Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs had written to the late Diane Henoch Padfer, justifying a decision to speak at a public meeting in praise of the late Rabbi Hugo Grin. This was the so-called Grin Affair. I, I'm, I'm not going to take up time this afternoon giving a blow-by-blow account of that affair. I've written about it elsewhere. Uh, um, uh, 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 the, uh, Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi, now Lord Sachs, of course, uh, was then a chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations. Uh, Hugo Grin was an Auschwitz survivor, was a media personality. Some of you may have heard him. Uh, on, on a BBC radio program called The Moral Maze. Hugo died. Uh, um, Jonathan Sachs did not go to the Lavoie. He was Menachem Oval, that has to be said, but he did not go to the Lavoie. There was a, 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 a communal outrage about this, and he subsequently agreed, that is, uh, uh, Jonathan Sachs subsequently agreed, to speak at a bizarre memorial meeting held at the TUC headquarters in Great Russell Street in London on the, on, on, on the, on the 20th of February, um, 1997. When news of this intention leaked out, uh, there was an almighty standoff between Jonathan Sachs and Henoch Padva, and Jonathan Sachs wrote a four page letter in Hebrew, in Hebrew, to Diane Padva, justifying his decision to speak at this bizarre memorial meeting. A copy of this letter, 
dated the 12th of Shvat 5757, 20th of January um, uh, uh, 5757. In, in that letter, uh, Jonathan Sachs uh, um, spoke in very, very harsh, personal, vituperative terms about Hugo Green, but explained that he was going to use the opportunity of this bizarre memorial meeting to publicly condemn uh, the reformed Jewish movement, which of course he never did. <clears throat> but the, for our present purposes, the important point is that the letter inevitably leaked out. It was leaked. Uh, the Jewish Chronicle got hold of, a, uh, uh, of, of the leak and eventually, after legal intervention, agreed to publish an expurgated translation of the letter. This translation omitted a number of paragraphs and, and phrases uh, which were uh, bitterly, personally, very critical of Hugo Grin. At one point in the four-page letter, uh, Jonathan Sachs had referred to Hugo Grin as uh, Otto Ho'ish, which is, as you, you will know, the, the phrase used in the Talmud to refer to Jesus of Nazareth. The, um, as I say, I have elsewhere dealt with this episode. Mr. Temko, Ned Temko, the, editor, the then editor of the Jewish Chronicle, explained to his readers that his translation omitted th simply three passages which he said were not absolutely central to the meaning of the letter. But ladies and gentlemen, I've read the letter and, it, and it, in my view, 17, there were 17 omissions, including the omission of a translation of a central paragraph. Great pressure, said Sachs to Padra, was exerted upon me to participate in the funeral and in the memorial service for their rabbi, the word rabbi is in quotes, Hugo Grin, this I did not do, and I was not affected by the hue and cry, for to have attended would have been to confer legitimacy upon reformed religious ceremonies and upon his, that's Grin's, perverse work within the reform movement, and this would have been an insult to the toe. That is my translation of one of the passages that Ned Temko uh, omitted uh, in his official translation of the letter. Um, well, incidentally, those of you who want to read about the omitted passages can look at a journal called Judaism Today, uh, in which I translate some of the most uh, venal, venal passages. Incidentally, we know now that the letter was leaked to the Jewish Chronicle on the personal initiative of the then Diane Henoch Padva, after it became clear that at that memorial meeting, uh, um, uh, uh, Jonathan Sachs did not, uh, as he said he was going to do, publicly denounce the, ref uh, uh, the reformed Jewish movement. Um, <clears throat> those of you who want to inquire further in this, should read the account of it by the late Dr. Meyer Persoff, who then worked in the offices of the Jewish Chronicle, and indeed he was the person who received the leaked letter. Dr. Persoff was a doctoral student of mine. I supervised his uh, PhD thesis uh, when I was a pro vice chancellor at the University of Mi uh, Middlesex University, London. Not since the Jacobs affair of 1961 to 64 had there been so much attention shown by the media, media to the inner workings of British Jewry. Not since that affair have the innermost divisions within British Jewry been exposed to public view. The chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations was revealed as a hypocrite, praising Hugo Grin at the TUC headquarters when he, when he had already damned him in a private letter.
to the best of my knowledge, no one in the media at that time questioned the Jewish Chronicle's decision to admit certain passages in the letter or inquired as to what those passages might contain. I find that fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. The Jewish Chronicle's rendition was accepted as definitive. Those within the world of Torah orthodoxy who believed or hoped that Dr. Sachs would resign were clearly mistaken. And in the immediate aftermath of the publication of, that of the letter, that possibility could not be, be dismissed. But within the Anglo-Jewish establishment, the feeling seems to have prevailed that however misguided their chief rabbi had been in writing the letter, his stupidity, and it is, uh, in my professional opinion, the most stupid letter ever written by a British chief rabbi, that stupidity could not be allowed to undermine the legitimacy of the office. His supporters privately shook their heads and wrung their hands, but publicly they supported him and shook their fists, trying to deflect national debate by focusing on the perfidy of the leaker. Find the leaker. Don't concentrate, it was said, on the letter. Certain of my Orthodox brethren, when I've spoken about this, have referred me to the writings of Rabbi Yisrael Meir Pupko, born in 1838 and died in 1933, better known uh, by the name of his most celebrated work, which he published in 1873, the Chofetz Chaim. And those of you who've read the Chofetz Chaim will know that it deals with the dangers of tale-bearing and of speaking slanderously about fellow Jews. Bubko's writings have acquired in Haredi quarters the status of halacha, and he's frequently cited as a role model. Actually, in my view, few rabbinical thinkers have done more damage to the social development of Jewish communities in the modern era. Bubko's condemnation of lashon, lashon horror, evil speech, can only be understood and must only be understood in the context of the turbulent history of strife between Jews in Vilna, where he grew up, and where untold harm was indeed wrought by Jewish factions denouncing other factions to the Tsarist authorities. They, one head of a yeshiva would say to the Tsarist authorities, shut down another yeshiva, that's a Zionist yeshiva, don't shut down my yeshiva. In fact, during a famous dispute over the Vilna Rabbinate at the turn of the 20th century, Popko himself indulged in the most blatant public defamation of one of the candidates, claiming that his action was necessary for overriding religious reasons. I'm sometimes told that to wash dirty linen in public is to give ammunition to anti-Semites. This was the argument used to me by the Board of Deputies when I announced that uh, at that lunch to which I referred at the beginning of my research, when I announced that I was going to name Jewish members of the National Front. They included, incidentally, a man called Albert Elder, who was a paid up member of the Muswell Hill United Synagogue, and who indeed stood for the National Front at the general election uh, of 1979, in the Hendon South parliamentary constituency. I'm sometimes told, and I publicly named and shamed Albert Elder, along with two other Jewish members of the front whom I also named and shamed. I'm sometimes told that to wash dirty linen in public is to give ammunition to anti-Semites. But if, as I sit at my word processor, I decide to suppress the truth because of anti-Semites, I've allowed them a victory over me. And I shall have permitted them to interfere with my right to freedom of expression. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is something I'm simply not prepared to do. The pursuit of truth and justice are two of the highest Jewish ideals. I recall and commend some words penned by the greatest novelist and poet to write in the English language, Thomas Harding. In the explanatory note 
that Hardy wrote to the first edition of his great novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, written in November 1891. Hardy felt it prudent to remind his audience of some words of St. Jerome. I repeat these words now, and I've no qualms about doing so, since I follow the maxim of the late Chief Rabbi Joseph Herman Hertz, who in the preface to the first edition of his Pentateuch and Aftoras, published in 1936, enjoined his fellow Jews to accept the truth from whatever source it comes. That's what Hertz said in 1936. Accept the truth, and, and, and the context for that was that, that, as those of you who know his Pentateuch and Aftoras will know, that he, he cited non-Jewish sources as well as Jewish sources. Accept the truth, said Hertz, from wherever source it comes. Ladies and gentlemen, the words of St. Jerome, quoted by Thomas Hardy, run thus, quote, If an offence come out of the truth, better is it that the offence come than that the truth be concealed. Thank you very much. Jeffrey, thank you for a very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions for you. Um, I just want to say <clears throat> you've quoted a number of papers as you've been through in articles. If people are interested in those and haven't made a note of it, this talk has been recorded and will be available so people can get back into it and pick up that information. I certainly will want to go back in and uh, refer to so, some of those articles that you've quoted to us. Extremely sure. interesting. Okay, right, um, questions for people. Um, if you'd like to put your hands up and we'll see if we can get to you. Yes. Who's that? Slammer Cryman. Okay, fire away. Professor Alderman, as always, it's an absolute pleasure to listen to you. I'm sorry I missed you over Pesach last year and I hope you and your wife are well. The question I have for you is something that troubles me about the Sachs Padva affair. As I understand it, Padva and his crowd, if I can call them that, have never accepted the rabbinical authority of the chief rabbinate. If I'm right on that, why didn't Jonathan Sachs just reply to Rabbi Padva and say, you don't accept my authority? So if you don't accept it, I'm not interested in your criticisms. Go and play in your Bote Midrashim and I'm going to do my job goodbye. Would you like to comment, sir? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. Um, uh, ha, ha, can I ask, have you read the four-page letter in so-called rabbinical Hebrew? I so-called have. <laughs> well, um, Incidentally, the only sense in which it's rabbinical Hebrew, in that it is, although it's written in ordinary Hebrew, it was written by a rabbi. It's a little arcane. Um, um, I, okay, the Union of Orthodox Hebrew Congregations does not accept the religious authority of the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations and never has. Um, but there is a certain real politique, a thread of real politique within the, the, the noisy and quarrelsome world of the <laughs> Union of Orthodox Hebrew Congregations. And although they would never have accepted the, authority, the religious authority of Jonathan Henry Sachs any more than, they, than their congregations accept the religious authority of, of um, of his successor Ephraim Mervis, in, in, indeed uh, uh, one prominent uh, um, member of the Haredi community in Stamford Hill has publicly written to condemn Mervis, publicly condemn Mervis, which uh, Henoch Padva never did over uh, Jonathan Sachs. But you're quite right. And I honestly do not know why Jonathan Sachs simply did not say, my dear Diane Padma, thank you so much for your letter, <laughs> which I've read with interest. I wish you a Gitten Shabbos goodbye. 
half a page, half a page would have done. But there was, I think, some, some psychology at work here. Jonathan Sachs never came from the Haredi world, the yeah. Ardas world, unlike his predecessor, Emmanuel Jakobowicz. Oh. Emmanuel Jakobowicz came from the world of the Ardas. He came from that world. And, and therefore, he did not need to prove his credentials, as it were, within that world. And the tragedy of Jonathan Sachs, uh, chief rabbin, it was that he was always looking over his right shoulder. Always. Uh, and, and I can only suppose and surmise that he was doing so in this case. But one subsequent event uh, that, 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 that I didn't mention in my talk, it, it didn't in fact concern me at all, uh, what, what, what was of course his being called to account for a, 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 a book uh, uh, oh, yes. that he published uh, subsequently uh, in, in which he had to rewrite sections of which he had to rewrite after being uh, summoned to a meeting of rabbis in Manchester yes, uh, because, uh, sorry, the Gateshead Rov was involved. The Gateshead, the then Gateshead Rov was indeed involved. It, it wasn't held at Gate. The meeting wasn't held at Gateshead. That's right. It was held at, at Ma in Manchester, uh, and and uh, Jonathan Sachs had, uh, ha 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 had published a book in which he had suggested that Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, could learn something from other religions. Well, of course, this created an international uproar. Isurim were issued against the book. Uh, 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 Sachs, accompanied by uh, Diane Ehrentroy, oh. flew up to Manchester and Sachs agreed to rewrite sections of the book. Subsequently, Sachs explained in, in, a, in, in, in a statement he made when he was speaking at the University of Cambridge, and this is referenced, the referen there is a reference to this in my book, British Jewry Since Emancipation, he did admit that had he not agreed to rewrite sections of that book, he would have had to have resigned his office. Um, I, have, um, I, I have a rare copy of the first version of that book, and a copy of the revised version, like the authorised version of the Bible and the revised version. Um, I, I was once asked on a uh, BBC radio programme, uh, the, 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 the interviewer said to me, Professor Alderman, the, the, the Jerusalem sage Rabbi El Yashiv uh, has said that, 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 that no Jew should possess a copy of his book, so how can it come you've got a copy of the original edition? And I said on air, look, what, what Rabbi El Yashiv said is you shouldn't have a copy of that book by Baez in your house or in your home. So the interviewer said to me, so where do you have your copy of this book? I said, it's in my potting shed. It's between the weed killer and the slug repellent. And um, <laughs> I, I satisfied there by the basic requirements of the halacha. I do know someone in Manchester who apparently kept the book on a piece of string outside his front bedroom window, so that he couldn't be said to have had the book Babais in his house. Lovely. Thank you. More questions for Geoffrey? Must be some out there, yes? Just unmute yourself. Martin, unmute yourself. Go on. Um, Carry on. Should right. Yeah, should be all right now. Can you hear me? Yes, go yes. on. Mark. Carry on. <laughs> Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I wasn't at the very beginning, so I'm not sure what the talk was was scheduled as. What concerns me somewhat is that we do, and we <laughs> unfortunately do live in a world, and have always lived in a world, where we have tremendous pressure on us from the outside as Jews and I believe sometimes correctly or incorrectly when these things are tried to be hushed up it's done for the not for bad motives but possibly 
good motives in that we do, as you've said, we don't want to give ammunition to our criticizers. But I've not read your books. I'm sorry, I will now try and find some and read them. When you do the history of the Jewish people in the United Kingdom or wherever, do you concentrate on these failures that we have? Or do you actually, is this talk, was this talk specifically about the hushing up of those things? Uh, well, because well, it seemed to me, all you had to say about the Jewish community today was that we have evil people among us, which we do, um, and there are no good people among us. Everybody is acting in a bad manner. I'm sure you didn't mean to portray that, but that's the portrayal I got. It, it, sir, if that's the portrayal you got, it's simply because of, of the title of my talk. Oh, this I, is I, what I, I, that's what I want. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the title. Self-censorship in Anglo-Druid. Right, okay. Then I let, apologize. Take, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Uh, yeah. Let, let's take the let's take the story of the fas the fascinating story of the um, Jewish communal macha crook and racketeer Maury Davis. Davis was president of the Federation of Synagogues, nineteen twenty eight to nineteen forty four. Incidentally, once he became president in nineteen twenty eight, he abolished elections. He said, "We don't need elections. I'm the president." Uh, and no further elections were ever held in the Federation during his presidency. Um, but in my book, in, in my new history of the Federation of Synagogues, uh, and I do want to pay public tribute here to the Federation in publishing what I wrote and, and not for one minute even trying to censor me, not even for one minute. You know, Davis was a multifaceted character. He was almost schizophrenic. He was a great communal macher, a great Zionist, a personal friend of Clement Attlee. Indeed, had Davis kept his nose clean, he could even have been found a seat in the 1945 general election. And who knows where he might have ended up? But he was also a racketeer. Uh, and um, what my own research opened up is the murky world of of joint racketeering between the Jews in Whitechapel and the Irish. Uh, th this is something that hadn't, if I may say so in my own defence, had not been thought about by those who had written about the politics of the, of, of, of the East End of London in, in the, be between, let's say, 1900 and 1945. This uh, mesalliance between the Jews uh, and the Irish. And, uh, um, you know, D Davis insisted, for example, that the Federation of Synagogues give a grant to miners after the, uh, the terrible, catastrophic Gresford Colliery disaster in, was it 1932? My memory escapes me at the moment. He was very outgoing, but he was also a crook. And, and he, he and his uh, Irish sidekick, the late councillor Jerry Long, whom I was privileged to interview six months before Jerry Long died of uh, cancer, uh, they ran Stepney politics. If you were Jewish and you wanted anything done in Stepney, you went to Maury Davis. Uh, if you were Irish and you wanted anything done, you went to Jerry Long. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. D Davis appointed himself he was Labour leader of Stepney Borough Council and Mayor of Stepney in 1930. And he appointed himself head of the Markets Committee, okay? The Markets Committee. So he'd go round Pedigate Lane Market and he'd say, uh, you've had your stall for 10 years, Geoffrey Alderman. I have to give it to someone else. So I'd say, Maury, you know, my wife and I've got a wife and five kids to keep. So Maury would say, go and discuss it with my mother, that's his mother, Bertha, in Rostreva Avenue, Stamford Hill. So you'd go, you'd schlack to Rostreva Avenue, Stamford Hill, and his mother, Bertha, would say, Jeffrey, Bubbler, I've got so many charities I'm collecting for this charity and that. Char Why don't you give a donation to one of my charities? And you'd leave the £50, a huge sum of money in those days, £50. 
and suddenly you'd get your market license renewed. Davis made himself head of the sanitary committee of Stepney Borough Council. So he'd go round to these sweatshops, these backyard, insanitary, unhealthy sweatshops. This is terrible, he'd say, terrible. We must shut this down at once. You'd say, Maury, there are five families who depend for their weekly weekly food on this. He'd go and see my mother birth in Mostreaver Avenue, Stamford Hill. And you'd go to Rostreaver Avenue there and you'd leave, leave a 50 pound note and suddenly it would all go quiet. He was a racketeer. Similarly, if you were an I, now the Irish were builders, of course, and they wanted the contracts for building air raid shelters. So they went to Jerry Long and, and they, they left a donation, a charitable donation with Jerry Long and they'd get the contract to build, to build a shelter. Incidentally, most of these shelters were, were absolutely death traps. And in 1940, Herbert Morrison, who was then in charge of air raid precautions, ha had to take the unique step of making himself the air raid precautions officer in Stepney to stop this corruption. It's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and and uh, I, I would like to think in what I've written about Davis, that I've shown the, pos the, the positives and the negatives, the positives and the negatives. That's what he was, a rounded character. Um, did, what can did, I say? Did, Except, did the 50 pounds actually go to charity or did it go in his pocket? Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you know I, I, I'll tell you two further things about Maury Davis. I could spend the whole afternoon right. talking about Maury Davis. Firstly, um, when he died, uh, uh, his executors contacted me because he'd never erected a tombstone to his mother. Bizarre. When his father died, there was a big sort of state funeral in Stepney. The local MP took very great care to go along to the Lavoya. But he, Davis never put up a mud saver to his mother. Very, very strange behaviour. And the executors came to me to ask about his mother's Hebrew name so that they could use some of the estate to erect the tombstone for her. And, and this, now we come to the second point, uh, uh, because uh, his executors said to me, he left a great deal of money. Where did this money come from? I said, I'll tell you where this money came from. <laughs> but I would like to stress, and I'm sure you will as well, that there are many, many great Jewish philanthropists and decent, honest people. Um, we're, not, we're not all crooks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Anyway, you know, you know, you know D Davis, excuse me, Chair, Davis had the last laugh. Without consulting anyone, in the 1930s, the, the Federation needed a new cemetery because their original cemetery at Edmonton was getting full up. So without consulting anyone, Davis bought a large tract, huge tract of waterlogged farmland in Raynham in Essex. It cost him more to drain the land than actually to buy the land. Well, some years ago, gravel was discovered on that land. And for 10 years, the Federation of Synagogues enjoyed mining royalties from the aggregates company that mined the gravel. Maury Davis must have been laughing his head off. Well, the Lord works in strange ways. <laughs> yes, he does. Yes, he does. I Thank think you. We, we must invite you back sometime to do this session on Maury Davis alone by the sound. <laughs> Rita, Rita Hammerman's got a question. Yeah. Oh, Richard. Can, you hear us? can you hear me? Yes. yes. Carry on. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor. Very interesting. I would like to ask you a question. How do you think that uh, Yakubovitz handled the JFS affair, the school affair, with a non Jewish child going to a Jewish school? Um, That's a different issue. <laughs> That is a different issue, but if the chair wants me to answer that question, I will answer it. It's up to the chair. No, go on. Why not indeed? We're interested in I, your opinion on this. I have written about this. I wrote an article in the, the Times, The Times, uh, about this. 
I think it was extraordinarily badly handled. Um, um, and and um, I, I'm going to reveal now in, in public something that, that happened in private. Uh, I, I said to, to uh, Jonathan, why don't you simply say to the governing body of the JFS that so far as you're concerned, they could admit the, the, a, a child to the school, but the fact that they'd admitted the child at school would not preclude any future view that he or his base in might take of the, of the Jewish identity of that child. This was done at the time of the child's bris. The child's bris was authorised by the United Synagogue on that stipulation. And the parents, well, I, wouldn't, I won't say the parents were ecstatically happy, but they were satisfied. The bris went ahead. And I said to Jonathan, let's do the same for the entrance to the school. But you know, as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says, the rich lamented and the poor complained, but the king would rack nothing of them. And uh, my plea fell on deaf ears. So, so the, whole, the whole issue rolled out of control and eventually ended up in the Supreme Court, costing the JFS a great deal of money, as I recall. It could all have been avoided. Yes, I agree. Totally agree with you. Gosh, so remember, you heard, you heard it here first. You heard it here first. Well, my two children went there, so I um, got interested. Yeah. Okay, one or, two, one or two more for Geoffrey, and then we must let him go, I think. Anybody else? Okay, can I, can I ask one then? Geoffrey, you talked about in the early days your discussions with the Board of Deputies and their view on your uh, freedom to speak up and, and decide what you wanted in the public arena. We yeah. live in very... We live in very different times today, of course, and uh, your quote about not airing our dirty linen in public still really applies for a lot of people. So do you think the board would have a different view on your controversial s positions on some of these things today in, in more modern times? Or are you um, in discussion with the board still on certain, art certain items? Am I in discussion with the board on certain items? Yes. Certainly not. Listen, so I'm, 70, I'm 76 years of age. I've got one foot in the grave. <laughs> uh, I've just finished my autobiography. I've written the Hesped for my own funeral, which will be at Raynham, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, I, intend to, I intend to die, if at all possible, in the depths of winter, when it would be very difficult to dig the grave. Uh, a lot of, I've warned the Federation now that they'll have to put up a marquee because a huge number of people will turn up to make sure that I really am dead. And um, I, I have, uh, you know, I really have little to do with the board uh, these days. Uh, um, the, 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 the issue over Jewish members of the National Front I found particularly upsetting. Uh, the 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 um, but but the board is under different management now, and of course, many of its archives are now no longer held by the board. They are still the property of the board, but they're held in London Metropolitan Archives, where they were they are being expertly uh, looked after. Very occasionally, however, very occasionally, I I am brought up against um, the old attitude. Um, I can give you two recent examples of this. By recent, I mean they've happened within the last, let's say, five years. Um, one was an extraordinary, extraordinary intervention by the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees, who wrote a bizarre letter to the head of the history department at the University of Bristol concerning the research of a research student, a PhD student, in that department. Um, I, 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 I won't bore you all with the, with the details of this, but this, the, the, this person's research 
con concerned, addressed in part, in part, the manner in which the Association of Jewish Refugees had gone about making an oral history of German and Austrian Jewish refugees from Nazism in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, now, you can take one view of this, or you can take another view. But I did think that for the Asso Association of Jewish Refugees, the AJR, to have written a, an official letter, official letter, uh, to the head of the history department at the University of Bristol, asking him in effect, in effect, to discipline this research student was beyond the pale. And I intervened, in, fa in fact, uh, I, I wrote an article, um, I think either for the Jewish Chronicle or the Jewish Telegraph in Manchester, I can't quite remember offhand. The other example, uh, a very, very sad, um, I know of two Jewish research students who are doing research into the, the life experiences of German and Austrian Jewish refugee children in Britain and who have unearthed, unfortunately, but let's for God's sake, for God's sake, face facts, have unearthed evidence of, of sexual abuse of these children. And these research students are being put under the most enormous pressure not to deal with this. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm speechless. Okay. These students are doing are doing research. They're, they're, they're doing research under the most eminent auspices. Why put them under this pressure? We still haven't quite grown up, ladies and gentlemen, have we? Jeffrey, uh, I go back to the question we had in the opening statement to say to what extent should the historian censor what he writes in order to meet, be censored in order to meet other perceived communal priorities. I think you've given us an insight to that this afternoon, controversially. Um, and, you know, perhaps we can invite you back to do another session for us, as I said, on Maurice, Maurice Davis alone. Uh, are you sure you want to invite me back? <laughs> Absolutely. All for the oh, same money, as you said in the beginning. We can talk about steam locomotives I have driven. Okay, that, that, that as well. Okay. Yes. I will, I'll be in touch with you again, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. It was fascinating. Thank you very much. I think a few of us will be going out buying some of your books now to follow up. Excellent. On Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Stay safe.